Let us prepare our hearts and minds through prayer. Blessed Lord, you cause all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ. Please take this opportunity to silence your phones if you haven't already. Thank you. Sheila's our sound effects person, so I have to wait for her. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Once upon a time, before change, people would listen to the radio. Entertainment to the listeners' living rooms, bedrooms, and kitchens. Families would gather around the amazing talking machine and listen to the voices of voices that brought them along. Music, comedy, current events, and news of things happening all around the world. Sometimes you might hear a play by Shakespeare, or a concert by a famous orchestra, and sometimes you might be magically transported to another time where you would meet people and experience things that you had only read about. And so today, you were there. Welcome to our radio and studio audiences for a special performance of You Were There, our program of living history. During the next few minutes, you will be transported back to the time of Martin Luther. And now, here is your host for our broadcast, Will Tilly. Thank you, Bruce. Today, I will be interviewing some people who knew Martin Luther and were there during his attempts to reform the church. Our first guest is from Eisleben in Saxony. Please welcome Hildegard Luther. Thank you for inviting me. I am told that you are one of Martin Luther's sisters. Yes, he was my older brother. But your last name is different. Well, as time passed, his name did change. I'm not sure why. When Martin started school, I thought that one of the teachers might have thought Luther was easier to pronounce than you do. It doesn't really matter. He's known and remembered as Martin Luther. Tell us about growing up with your, with your brother. Uh, what did your father do? He was a businessman. He had leases for a copper mine and a smelter. It was dangerous work, and everyone prayed to the Virgin Mary. Mother, St. Anne, protection and safety. We also worried about ghosts and evil spirits in the nearby forests. We prayed for protection from them, too. We knew that God could judge us and maybe punish us. St. Anne and the other saints would shield us from that. And your mother? She was a very hard-working woman. She, cooked, she, she took very good care of us and made sure that we did not do bad things. If we did, she would punish us severely. But all good mothers did that. Father was a harsh disciplinarian, too. But both of our parents truly loved us. When did your brother start school? Martin was seven years old when he began school, and he grew up, he went to three different schools. He studied grammar, which helped him write so many books. 
Another subject was rhetoric, where he learned how to be such a good writer and speaker. He wasn't too fond of his classes in logic, but they helped him when he studied philosophy at the university. It sounds like he was very well educated. Oh, he was. I always envied him because girls like me weren't allowed to go to school. It was because the schools were taught by priests and brothers. All were men, and girls would not have fit in. We were born to be mothers and housekeepers. Why did he go on to the university? He was inspired by the teachers in his last school. They shared their love of scripture and music with him, and he thought that maybe he would become a priest himself. But Father had a different idea. He wanted Martin to become a lawyer. A lawyer or a judge would have enhanced our family's status and helped Father manage his business affairs. So what happened? My brother studied hard and long and learned many things. He received a master's started to study law, and suddenly dropped out. He decided to become a monk, and he joined the Augustinians, one of the religious orders in this church. It was because of the thunderbolt. The thunderbolt? Yes. He had visited us and was on his way back to the university during a lightning storm. He was almost struck by the thunderbolt. He fell to the ground and was terrified. He prayed to St. Anne and told her that if she saved him from death, he would become a monk. He said later that he was called by terrors from heaven. A few days later, he entered the cloister. And what did your father think? Father was furious. He thought Martin would be wasting his life. He would never amount to anything. But wasn't he ordained a priest? And didn't he go on to the city of Wittenberg and become part of the university? Yes, that's true. He taught the university. But I think Martin was full of doubts about himself. He once told me he wasn't sure he was worthy enough to offer up the bread and the wine because he was only a sinful monk. But he had to obey the church teachings. He was always afraid that he or our parents might die as sinners. Not reach him. Even if he did all the pious acts that monks were supposed to do, he might never deserve heaven. But he apparently changed over time. It was after he went to Rome. Rome? He was sent there on business by his superior in the Augustinian order, and while there he was told that he could shorten our parents' time of suffering in purgatory by buying indulgences, venerating relics of the saints, or doing penances. Um, I'm sorry, what is purgatory? Well, if you die with certain sins on your soul, you must spend time in purgatory. It's almost as bad as hell, but after a time your sins are removed and you can enter hell. So, by doing some special things, could shorten the lives of people in purgatory? Yes, that's what the church teaches. So what did your brother do? There was a staircase in Rome that had been brought from Jerusalem that Jesus had actually once climbed. And Martin was told that if he climbed the stairs on his knees and said a special prayer at each step, his parents' time in purgatory would be reduced. So, he climbed the stairs. I guess we can't know if the climbing or the praying did any good. Only God would know that. But when Martin had finally reached the top, he asked himself a question. Who knows if this is really true? Can God's punishments be reduced by such acts? He suffered a lot through the years, but I will always love him. I will always be proud of my brother, Martin. Thank you, Hildegard, for sharing your stories about your brother. We look forward to hearing from other guests. Goodbye, and God bless you.
Please welcome our next guest, Father Johann Tetzel. May God be with you. Thank you, Father Tetzel. Please tell us about yourself. I understand that you work on behalf of the Pope. Some will say that. However, I'm doing God's work. God's work on Earth. What sort of work do you do? Primarily, I work to protect the Christian faith from error. If persons fall into sin by disobeying the church or preaching false doctrine, I intervene and examine their souls to determine God's punishments. But I was given a new assignment by our blessed Pope. A new assignment? Tell us about it. As you may know, we are all concerned about the state of grace in our lives after death. If a person dies in a state of sin, they might spend time in purgatory before they can enter heaven. The living can help the dead by reducing their time in purgatory through prayers, masses, pilgrimages, and indulgences. How does all this work? For example, someone might pay me to say certain prayers for a departed loved one, or I may be asked to say a mass for the dead, or an appropriate donation, I would do that. A pilgrimage to a holy place and money for its support would also be rewarded by fewer days in purgatory. That's very interesting. What are indulgences? Christians have long known that they must do penance to be purged of their past sins. Remember that Jesus told his disciples that they had the power to bind or release sins. As a descendant of the disciples, I, the Pope, and my fellow priests have those powers. By releasing someone from their sins, I make them right with God. Indulgences are a special way to release sins from the living and the dead and shorten their paths through purgatory in heaven. Do indulgences cost money? Yes. Sinners who pay money receive a document that says that they, or someone to whom they assign the indulgence, a dead relative perhaps, would have their stay in purgatory reduced for a specific amount of time. Where does the money go? Do you keep it all? Of course I do not keep it all. Most of the donations go to the Holy Father in Rome. He's building a new church. Some goes to our beloved Archbishop to help pay his debts to the Pope. And the little that is left is kept by me. Are indulgences then very popular? And do you sell a lot of them? God blessed me with special powers as a preacher. When preaching about sin and salvation, contrition and penance, I always talk about indulgences and their power. My spiritual gifts and enthusiasm attract large audiences. Buying an indulgence or paying me to say mass for the dead is much easier than having to make a pilgrimage to Rome or some other holy place like Jerusalem. Yes, they are very popular. But I've been told that not everyone agrees with you or believed in the powers of pilgrimages, penances, and indulgences. You must be thinking of that sinner, the Augustinian. You mean Martin Luther? Yes, Luther the heretic. Why do you say he's a heretic? Because of those notices he posted on the doors of the Church of Wittenberg. There were 95 of them. Some even suggested that the Pope was an error. One even said the preachers, like me, are wrong in saying that papal indulgences can free sinners from penalties. The man went against Rome. So what did you do? I responded with a list of my own. I wrote 106 statements defending the Pope and pointing out how Luther was a danger to the church. I, of course, notified the authorities in Rome about what this Augustinian monk was up to. It sounds like you were really upset about what Martin Luther was saying. Of course I was. I had been doing so much work on behalf of the Pope and the church. By selling indulgences, I saved many a person here and in purgatory from everlasting punishment. The money I earned was used for many good purposes, building the new cathedral in Rome, for example. So the money was important, too? It was. And as the saying goes, as soon as the coin in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory upward springs. <laughs> Thank you, Father Tessel, for telling us about your ministry. It was very interesting to hear from you. Thank you for listening. Next on our program is Father Erhard Schaefer. 
Tag. Please, Father, tell us about yourself. I grew up in Wittenberg with four brothers and three sisters. My father was a merchant and our mother died when I was in school. I've been told that you and Martin were very close, both studying to be priests. Yes, that is correct. Were you close friends? We were, though it was sometimes hard to be his friend, especially later in life when he got himself into some trouble. What sort of person was he? He was very smart and very serious. He loved reading the Bible, though sometimes he seemed confused, wondering if the things we studied were really true. How would you say he got along with you and the other students? Martin was always courteous and friendly. He was never stern or grumpy. Did he change much after he, as you put it, got himself in trouble? Even though he might be exhausted by his writings and worries, he always remained energetic. In the social gathering, he was usually witty, lively, and joyful. He kept a bright and happy face no matter how much trouble he was in. When he preached, he had a voice that could be sharp or gentle, but always clear and understandable. It sounds like you admired him a lot. I did even though he often seemed confused during our studies, more so after he went to my hometown to teach. Wittenberg? Yes, Wittenberg. I also, I was also sent there as a teacher, so our discussions that we began in seminary continued. His beliefs began to change. As the Pope might say, he began to drift away from the true teachings of the Church. Tell us about it. When we first met, again, he was very serious. He told me once that he was terrified that God might reject him because of his sins. He thought that no matter how much he prayed, did penance, or how many good works he performed, it would not be enough to overcome his sins and reach heaven. But didn't the church teach that such actions would be rewarded? That's what we were taught. But the more Martin read scripture, the more he had his doubts. I heard that the Bible was very important for him. Yes, it was. In his reading, he began to compare the rules set down by the church with the gospel. Church rules were law, gospel was what Christ our Lord did. Both of us were taught that we would become pleasing to God by doing penance, saying mass, doing good works, and following the law. But Martin's doubts began to grow the more he studied scripture. But why did that happen? It seems to me that he tried to find writings in the Bible about the rules of the church. Writings that describe rules about purgatory or justifying yourself with good works, things like that. But the more he looked, the more he began to doubt. He decided that the gospel and not the law was about good news and mercy. So what did this mean? He began to preach that we should give up all hope of justifying ourselves by doing good works, going on pilgrimages, doing penance, all the things prescribed by the law. Instead, righteousness comes by faith faith in the Lord Jesus. He decided that you could not buy your way to heaven. You could not purchase God's favor. So that must be why the sale of indulgences offended him so much. It bothered him a lot. He felt that people buying indulgences would become self-satisfying and safe from God's judgment. They could sin and not fear punishment. And he felt that such teachings were corrupting the church. So that's why he posted those notices on the church door? Yes, it was. Of course, he never could have predicted what would happen. He wasn't trying to destroy the church or separate from it. He wanted the church to correct what he thought was wrong and to adhere to the teachings of the gospel. As time passed, he wrote many other things about the church, about Christianity, and about faith. He felt that grace was a gift from God to those with faith. It was very simple. But what about good works? Later, he liked to say that God's grace is poured into us from above and overflows in good works to our neighbors. Anyone with true faith does works of love, not to be justified, but because they already are. It was hard for me to understand. I'm not sure that I still do. But no matter what anyone might say or believe, Martin was a good person. He truly loved Jesus. Thank you, Father Schaefer. Our audience appreciates what you've shared with us. Thank you. childhood friend of Martin, Rabbi Yehuda ben Yosef. Boker Tov, Shalom. 
So you have known Martin for a long time? Yes, yes I have. We grew up in the same village, Eisleben. It was in Saxony. What was it like, the, the village, I mean? Was it a happy place? Ah, ah, my friend. Most of the people were poor. Martin's father was successful, so his family lived pretty well. Most of the villagers were Christians, so we Jews had a hard time. It was best for us to try and be invisible. But you and Martin were friends. We were, we were, but we were secret friends. I don't think his family ever knew about our friendship. Remember, Jews had long been accused of being responsible for the crucifixion of Jesus. So Martin was going against his tradition by having a Jewish friend. But we were just little boys playing in the forest, so we never thought about such things. Were you still friends when you grew up? Uh, we lost track of each other when he went away to school. But I always had good memories of our times together in Eisleben. I was excited when we met again in Wittenburg. He was now a priest and I had become a rabbi. How did you meet again? We were in the marketplace. He was looking for a pig. To the table at the university. He saw me not recognizing me first. He must have thought I was a storekeeper. He asked my advice regarding which pig to buy. Which one would taste the best? Uh, that must have been a little awkward. No, you're all kidding. When I told him that I didn't eat pork, he started to laugh. And it's then that he recognized his old friend from childhood, Yehuda ben Joseph, the little Jewish boy. Was he happy to see you again? He was, as I was to see him. We spent the afternoon together, remembering the fun we had as children, and learning what each of us had done since we separated the years before. Where did you spend the afternoon? I mean, a priest and a rabbi together might have been scandal. Ah, it was, it was. Fortunately, our clothes were old and nondescript, so we looked like any poor person in the village. We went to a public house where the beer was good and celebrated our reunion. So you were friends again? Yes, yes, but under different circumstances. We both knew that because he was a professor at the university, it shouldn't be known that he had a Jewish friend. Christians were not supposed to associate with Jews except to buy things from merchants or maybe to borrow money. Our friendship had to be kept a secret. What sort of things did you do together? Uh, Martin loved to read scripture, both his and ours. He wanted to understand the beginnings of the Jewish and the Christian scriptures. He wanted to read them in the original languages. I guess that no one will ever know that I helped Martin with his Hebrew and Greek. You helped him? I did. I was familiar with both languages. I learned them during my studies of the Torah, the Tanakh, the Ketuvim, and other sacred writings. He was a scholar, and he appreciated my help. He couldn't tell me anyone or anything about being helped by a rabbi to learn Greek and Hebrew. You see, it was our own private joke. when later in his life he began to write many hurtful things about the Jews. It was. It was. By then, I hadn't seen him for some time because he was always traveling because the church authorities were after him. 
I think he may have lost part of his way because of stress, poor health, getting older, we all get older, and perhaps fear. I like to think that his anti-Semitic writings were caused by that. He had suffered so much at the hands of his church and his interpretations gospel were denied. He apparently began to criticize anyone who disagreed with his beliefs. Needless to say, our interpretations, those of the Jewish people, challenged some of his beliefs. I think that this might have caused him to lash out at us too. Were you ever able to talk with him about any of this? Uh, sadly, no. I remained in Wittenberg, and we lost contact with each other. However, however, I'd like to remember him by his earlier writing. He once wrote a wonderful essay about Jesus, and that he was a Jew. He wrote that persecution of the Jews was a bad idea. He encouraged Christians to treat Jews kindly and present them in true scriptural teaching. Violent efforts, you see, to convert the Jews. Not what Christ want his people to do. So these later writings don't bother you? No, of course they do. Of course they do, but I would rather remember Martin as a boyhood friend. Someone I helped in his studies. And someone who always tried to do what he thought was right. Martin will always be a dear friend. Thank you, Rabbi Joseph. Your story about your friend was very interesting. Some of the local princes would rather support a heretic 
and support the Holy Father in Rome. Why would they do that? Well, I suspect some of the faithless local rulers did not want to send money to Rome for the support of the Pope and his holy activities. Well, what happened then? While in hiding, Luther began to write down his opinions. The new printing press made it possible for him to publish a whole library of writings designed to reform the church. Many were even written in German instead of in, in Latin, the language of the church. His writings were spread almost everywhere. What did the Pope do? The Pope issued a special letter called a papal bull that condemned Luther's teachings and called for the burning of all his books and writings. Did Martin Luther obey? No, he did not. He burned the papal bull and some other letters from the Pope. He even burned some of the books describing church law. He didn't show much good sense. After all, who is this insignificant monk compared to the majesty of the church? Did the uh, Pope go after him when he disobeyed? Well, of course he did. Uh, Luther was given a chance to defend his teachings during a trial at the city of Burroughs. Again, he refused to recant and became a criminal. Frederick, his protector, arranged for him to escape Worms and go into hiding at the, in the castle at Wartburg. Was he ever heard from again? He was, time and again. While living in the castle, he translated the New Testament into German. That meant that anyone could read scripture in their own language. Before, people like me were needed to explain the holy writings written in Latin to the common people. Luther changed that. And even though he had been excommunicated, cut off from the church, he continued to write minister to the people and always remained a Christian. It was hard to imagine. So was he right or wrong to do what he did? Well, he went against all that I was taught. Though sometimes I think that maybe the church might have needed some reform. Perhaps some future pope might say that there really was corruption in the church and Martin Luther tried to do something about it. I can't say that. But I do know that things were never the same after that monk from Wittenberg nailed those letters to the church door. Thank you, Cardinal Fiore. Your story was very interesting. May God be with you. Our next guest is Lisette, a young girl from the city of Varnes. Please tell us more. The 
first day of the trial began in the late afternoon. Father Luther was brought to the town hall from where he was staying. Along the streets, people had climbed up on many of the rooftops so they could see him. The crowds were very large, and most people couldn't fit into the hall. It was very exciting. What happened first? There was a big pile of books in the room. An archbishop asked Father Luther if he had, if he had written them all. He said that he was the author. The archbishop then asked if he would say what he had written was wrong. What did he say? He said that he would need to think it over and pray a little. The archbishop was surprised and told him to come back the next day. Because I can't read, I didn't know why the books were so important. What happened the next day? Everyone came back to town, to the town hall by 6 o'clock in the evening. It was dark and the hall was overflowing with people. The archbishop asked the same questions as before. Did Martin Luther answer the questions? No, he didn't. Instead, he began to talk about his writings. He said some were to teach, pe to teach the faithful. I think he meant humble people like me. Some books told where the Holy Father, the Pope, made mistakes. That made me a little afraid. He said the other books were answers to what other people, mostly church officials, were saying about him and what he was writing. He said that they were wrong. What did you think about all of this? A lot of it I didn't understand because I was never educated. I think some of the cardinals and bishops didn't understand either because I kept asking Father Luther to speak in Latin instead of German. He sometimes seemed to smile at that because he usually spoke German every day just like the rest of us did. What happened next? How long did things go on? The trial lasted about two hours. I felt sorry for Father Luther because it seems almost and that he must admit that he was going against the Pope of God himself. He was very brave. How did the day end? He spoke wonderfully and never gave in to the emperor, the princes, the cardinals, or the bishops. Finally, he said that he was bound by the scriptures and his conscience was a prisoner to the word of God. He said that he couldn't go against his conscience. So he didn't do what they all wanted him to do? He didn't give in? No. I'll always remember what he told them. He said, I cannot do otherwise. Here I stand. Thank you, Lisa, for telling us your story. As you said, it sounds like Martin Luther was very brave. Thank you for having me on the program. Part of history.